everyone, I am Kimberly, the 5-Minute NP. The 5-Minute NP was born out of my belief that small, incremental changes can drastically change the trajectory of your life. Our genes do not have to determine our lifespan. My goal through this podcast is to act as a roadmap that bridges the gap between knowledge and action, leading to you living your healthiest, happiest, longest life. Welcome to the 5-Minute NP Podcast. Hello, everyone. I was so fortunate to speak with Dr. Nathan Bryan, one of the world's leading authorities and top experts on nitric oxide. Dr. Bryan is a scientist, a researcher, professor, author, and successful entrepreneur who has commercialized his nitric oxide technology. The U.S. Olympica team and many other athletes have used his nitric oxide supplements to improve their athletic performance. Dr. Bryan discusses how nitric oxide is the most miraculous molecule we have in our body, and it is the secret anti-aging. Also, the loss of nitric oxide is the earliest event in the onset and progression of most, if not all, chronic diseases. In fact, 8 out of the top 10 causes of death are associated with a loss of nitric oxide. Also, risk factors and consequences of COVID can also be correlated with the loss of nitric oxide. Often, The first sign seen as a loss of nitric oxide is sexual dysfunction in both sexes. Nitric oxide does decline as we age, but Dr. Bryan discusses what we can do to boost our nitric oxide levels. In addition, he discusses what we should be avoiding, including mouthwash and proton pump inhibitors and other antacids. Dr. Bryan discusses his new book, Functional Nitric Oxide Nutrition, which provides dietary strategies to prevent and treat chronic disease. Dr. Brian shares fascinating and life-changing information. Enjoy the episode and welcome to the 5-Minute NP Podcast. Well, hi, Dr. Brian. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Good. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Well, I didn't realize when I wanted to learn more about nitric oxide that I would have found you like the expert, the world authority on this topic. So I feel very fortunate. Well, thank you. you know we've been we've been doing this for a long time more than 20 years now so it's you know I, I always accept the opportunity to educate and inform on nitric oxide because I think it's it's too important and it's really one of those things that you know if you don't know about nitric oxide and you're struggling with you know, some health issues uh, nitric oxide really fills in a lot of blanks of people that have been unmanaged many many years yeah um well, you know how I started, you know, in NP school, I mean, you learn a little bit about it, but nothing like it's totally an underlying cause for so many problems and health related issues. Um, you know, I have a question when I first started studying it a little more, why I got interested in it is because I was learning about short workouts and how they benefit our health. Do you feel like those short workouts are related to the benefits of nitric oxide? Well, sure. There's, there's, a lot of evidence to suggest that. In fact, that's why exercise is medicine because it stimulates the production of nitric oxide. And so, you know, the best example is when you begin to exercise, your either your heart or the working skeletal muscle need an increase in oxygen and nutrient delivery to basically fuel those working muscles and cells. And so the only way to do that is through the production of nitric oxide in the lining of the blood vessel, which causes vasodilation. So you get an increase in, in blood flow to, to that particular organ, primarily the heart, because you increase the workload on the heart. Uh, then you've got to, you know, get rid of the waste products. So it's really the good stuff in, the bad stuff out. Uh, it's our cardiovascular system, and that's really controlled by the production of nitric oxide. So the, but the other critical thing is, you know, you need oxygen to make oxide. And so if you're doing the high intensity interval training and you're really hinging upon that anaerobic threshold, you know, when you run out of oxygen, your, your body can't make nitric oxide in the lining of the blood vessel. You know, we've discovered an alternative pathway whereby it can reduce uh, inorganic nitrate and nitrite during hypoxia, but you've got to be able to titrate your levels up to have that reservoir to make nitric oxide under anaerobic conditions. So yeah, to answer your question, moderate physical exercise is critically important in the production of nitric oxide. Um. Well, let me just back up because I kind of jumped ahead, I guess. What even led you down this path of studying this? Well, you know, I've always been interested in in science and medicine. I was an undergraduate student at UT Austin. 
uh, University of Texas, and I got a degree in biochemistry, a bachelor's degree in biochemistry, and it was there that I was involved in undergraduate research. Mm. And I really enjoyed this kind of, you know, in, in the basic sciences, we can ask any question we want and then design experiments to provide answers to that important biological question. And so there's no feeling like the feeling of discovery. And so I had a lot of unanswered questions. And then when I was in LSU School of Medicine in Shreveport, you know, I trained with a guy who was a pharmacologist that had been working in the nitric oxide field for probably 20 years at that time in the early 2000s. And I became interested in that. The Nobel Prize had just been awarded in 1998 for the discovery of nitric oxide. So we knew it was an extremely important molecule. Uh, we knew it controlled, it was involved in many, many disease processes, but there was still a lot we didn't know and understand. And so really the, my work in my PhD was developing sensitive and specific methods to detect nitric oxide in biological samples because you know, you don't need a lot of nitric oxide to have an effect. And so it's very low levels. And so it's been difficult to measure and detect that. And so really that was my work. And once we had developed the methods to detect and quantify nitric oxide in both blood or any biological compartment, then we could then create a fingerprint of NO biology in every single disease process, whether it's cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, heart attack, stroke, um, and so that's got me, that got me interested because one, once we did that, we had the tools to really not just understand many diseases, but then begin to, you know, strategize and rationalize therapeutics that could restore the production of nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. Has this been rewarding to you? It has. It's been, you know, look, it's just like any profession. You have to deal with the daily frustrations and really the temporary failures or roadblocks you encounter. And so lots of those in, in science and medicine. But, you know, we've, we've been very successful at making a lot of discoveries that have dozens of issued patents. Um, we've commercialized those on a number of fronts in many different markets. Um, you know, the most gratifying part of what I do is getting, you know, dozens of phone calls or emails from people whose life you've changed. Um, and so to me, there's nothing more gratifying than that to positively impact people's lives. And as a clinician, I'm sure you experienced that too. It's, it's really the most gratifying thing we can do is, is positively impact people's lives, other people's lives. Um, well, you yourself are responsible for discovering things, right? I mean, you have your own, you know, that's pretty awesome. What obstacles did you meet along the way? Oh man, there's <laughs> a lot. Well, you know, in in the basic sciences, you know, you design an experiment and you expect an answer. I mean, mm -hmm. you rationalize that you create these so-called hypotheses and then you expect to get a certain answer. And when you don't, you know, people think, well, the experiment didn't work, or maybe we were naive, but the experiment always works. It always gives you an answer. It may not be the answer you're looking for, but it provides answers and really pointed us in a different direction. So it was a series of kind of unsuccessful or unanticipated answers we got from our experiments that then led us down a different path. Mm -hmm. so those were the daily hurdles. And then, you know, once you have patents and you commercialize this, you know, in an academic environment, we have what's called conflicts of interest. And then you've got the bureaucrats that try to manage your conflicts of interest. And so, you try to uh, commercialize these, these discoveries because you, know, you, you make discoveries that impact human health and disease. So the major hurdle that I encountered in my academic, when I was full-time academia, was you know, maintaining an active nitric oxide research program while the bureaucrats were telling me that I had to limit my research because I had a conflict of interest. Mm. And so that really creates a hurdle. And I think that's why it's a major reason why there's very little innovation and commercialization that comes out of academic institutions. So they want you to discover, they want you to invent, they want you to innovate. But once you do that, it's almost like you become an enemy of the state. Hmm. They have to manage your conflict of interest and basically shut down the innovation in the research. Now, di different universities do better jobs than others. Mm -hmm. 
crisis management is necessary. It's a it's necessary to keep you know people from um, you know utilizing state and national resources to put money in their own pocket. Mm -hmm. So it's a balance. And then you know when you when you come out with new products and new innovations, you get people that try to knock you off and copy you and you know, steal your ideas and steal your technology. Uh, so you know it's a new challenge every day, every week, every year. But the most important thing is you address them and be honest and, and move forward. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, I read your book, Functional Nitrate. Um, what is it? Yeah, nitric oxide. Perfect. And um, wow, I mean, you go into the history of you know medicine and vitamins, and it was really interesting. But you mentioned that nitric oxide is the secret to anti-aging. Um, to age in the free, you know, the absence of disease and um, keeping healthy nitric oxide is so crucial. Um, so I'm looking forward to talking about that, but why don't you just discuss, you know, I know you talk about it all the time, but just what is nitric oxide in itself? That's a very good question. It's, it's really at its core, it's a signaling molecule, which means that it's how cells in the body communicate with one another. So the best example is that nitric oxide produced in the endothelial cells, and that's the outer, or the, the outer layer of the inside of the blood vessel. So when nitric oxide is produced, it communicates with the smooth muscle cells that line the blood vessels underneath the endothelium. And then it tells those blood vessels to dilate and relax, or to relax and dilate. So that's the kind of the, the most well-described signaling aspects of nitric oxide. But it's also part of our immune system and how our white blood cells fight off pathogens, bacteria, mm -hmm. viruses, uh, really any pathogen. Mm -hmm. The signaling molecule there, and it's an antimicrobial, antiviral, antibacterial, but it's also a neurotransmitter in the nervous system. So it's how neurons fire and it's postsynaptic, presynaptic communication in the central nervous system. Um, but it's responsible, you know, every single age-related chronic disease has a common denominator. And it doesn't matter if it's Alzheimer's and vascular dementia or heart disease, kidney disease, liver disease, diabetes, it's all reduced blood flow to that particular organ. Mm -hmm. that, that's a fundamental truth about all chronic disease. And so why do, why do you have a deficiency of reduced, or a def, reduced blood flow to those organs? It's because your body's lost the ability to make nitric oxide. Mm -hmm regulate blood flow to that organ. So there, there's a, a kind of a succession or progression of disease, you know, whether it's Alzheimer's that starts off with mild cognitive disorders and, you know, hypofusion, what we call vascular dementia. Um, and can mirror this or actually image this on functional MRI and see in these mildly cognitive disordered patients that they have reduced blood flow to the prefrontal cortex Mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, it's Parkinson's, it's bipolar, it's addictive disorders. Common denominator is always a loss of regulation of blood flow. And it's the same in heart disease. It's the same in sexual dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Increased blood flow to specific regions at a, at a time of need, then disease it. And all of that is controlled by the production of nitric oxide. So the older we get, the less we make for age-related disease. Wow. You know, it's funny, somebody on Twitter yesterday just happened to say, why is it when people are at, at 50 years old, why does everything, you know, why does it seem like things are going downhill, life is over? And I thought about something you said, it was like, well, yeah, because over 40, our nitric oxide levels are declining, or really as we age, they're declining. And I thought about you, I was like, oh, that's probably why. That's probably why we're tired, why we don't have the energy because of everything that this molecule really does for mm -hmm. us as far as our, our cells, our ATP, our powerhouse of our cells. Um, I found it interesting and it's so crucial to understand that you said like eight out of 10 of the top causes of death are related to loss of nitric oxide, loss of blood flow, what you're talking about, which is, that's huge when you think about that. Heart disease being number one for a long, long time. Yeah, you know, and to me, that's unacceptable because we know unequivocally what causes cardiovascular disease. It's the loss of nitric oxide production. We know how to detect it early on in terms of endothelial dysfunction. And there's 
technology to completely reverse it and restore it. So I think the missing link is just education and awareness mm -hmm. from physicians and healthcare providers, but also from the patients. Mm -hmm. That's why I think it's so important what you do and other people do is, you know, not just educate yourself, but educate your patients mm -hmm. and the, the patient uh, in general on how important this is. That way they can take the steps and really their hands and do what they need to do to prevent loss of nitric oxide production and keep themselves healthy because we know that the way medicine's practiced for the past probably 100 years doesn't work. We spend more money in the U.S. per capita than we're the sickest population. So right. it's clear that doesn't work. Going to your doctor and practicing this reactive form of medicine does not work. You have to be proactive. It's much easier to prevent disease than it is to treat it. Right, right. And, you know, I feel like this is even so relevant during this time of COVID. I mean, you when you kind of understand what's going on with COVID, ultimately, it causes endothelial dysfunction, it, oxidative stress, endothelial dysfunction, right. and people with these underlying diseases of high blood pressure and diabetes are so much at risk because they're already struggling in that area. Is that right? Exactly. Right. We've over the past ten months, everything we've learned about COVID and coronavirus is can be explained by the loss of nitric oxide. So, you know, we're exposed to viruses every day of our life, from the time we're born to the time we die, and most of us don't get sick. But there's susceptible populations that get sick with the even the, the smallest source of the exposure to viruses. So why is that? We asked that question years ago. Well, the point is, is that if you can, if your body is robust and your immune system and your cardiovascular system can generate a lot of nitric oxide, then when you're exposed to a virus, say for instance, coronavirus, tangled in your buccal, in your uh, mucous membranes, whether it's your airway or your uh, buccal cavity or even in your eyes, our body recognizes that and then ice mobilizes our immune system, which you got to have good blood flow to get your immune system to the site of attack. And then your immune system generates a lot of nitric oxide and it shuts down viral replication. So you may be exposed to it, but immediately your immune system and blood system attacks it and shuts it down. So you never get sick. The problem in people with these underlying comorbidities, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, pulmonary disease, the ones that are most susceptible, is they cannot generate nitric oxide. So it not only explains their underlying health condition, but it explains the increased susceptibility to coronavirus infection and the rapid progression of disease. So it's a nitric oxide problem. So it, it not only prevents your immune system from killing it, but it then attacks your endothelium. Mm -hmm. Create this condition called endothelitis or an inflammation of the, the endothelium. And your endothelium is everywhere. It's, it's, lines the blood vessels of every single tissue, organ, and cell of your body. Wow. So it also explains the increased risk of blood clotting disorders, mm -hmm. kidney disease, kidney dysfunction, pulmonary disease, and pulmonary dysfunction that last long after the infection is gone. Mm -hmm. So everything related to coronavirus, disease, etiology, and progression can be explained by the loss of nitric oxide production. Wow. And to us because we have a drug in phase three clinical trials now specifically for COVID. And so wow. we, we're addressing, so we got an investigative new drug application from the FDA through this coronavirus accelerated treatment program to investigate nitric oxide in African-Americans with COVID. Mm. As you're probably familiar, African-Americans suffer about three times higher rate of infection about a four to five times higher rate of hospitalization, mm -hmm. three to six times higher death rate from coronavirus. And so our approach is you take these patients early on within 72 hours of a positive test, and then we implement therapy immediately. And then we follow up for days and we're seeing, you know, blood oxygen levels go from these within 10 minutes. And our hope is that we can reduce hospitalization, ventilation, and death. And in this very population. Mm, yeah. I wasn't sure if um, 
you know, is because they have a higher risk of high blood pressure, you know, if they're more at risk for that, and, you know, maybe uh, vitamin D deficiency. I didn't know if that was putting them at more risk as well. Yeah, so yeah, all of these comorbidities, which increase the risk of infection and progression of disease, um, is due to loss of nitric oxide. Yeah. So that's why they become increased risk of infection and this rapid progression of disease and hospitalization. And so when you think about you, just in general, having high blood pressure and heart disease, you mentioned that, you know, yeah, it declines as we age, this nitric oxide declines as we age, but yet when you have these underlying diseases, it just accelerates the process, right? That's exactly right. Right, wow. So that's and what I tell people is you have to understand, number one, you gotta understand <clears throat> how important nitric oxide is and then begin to get an assessment of how well your body generates nitric oxide. And really people, it's, it's really very simple. It's not rocket science. So there's two things you gotta do. You gotta stop doing the things that disrupt nitric oxide production. And then you gotta start doing the things that have been clinically proven to restore and, and stimulate nitric oxide production. So the first part of that question is what, what, what potentially am I doing that's shutting down nitric oxide production? So number one, we're not eating enough green leafy vegetables. So it's diet related. Number two, the use of antiseptic mouth you know, 200 million Americans wake up every morning and use mouthwash once, twice, sometimes three times daily. And there's evidence now, we've published on it in several other groups, that when you use mouthwash, it shuts down, it kills the bacteria in your mouth, disrupts your microbiome, and shuts down nitric oxide production. Wow. We see an elevation in blood pressure with mouthwash use. We see that the cardioprotective benefits of exercise are lost when you use mouthwash. So I tell people, if you're using mouthwash, you have to stop. Mm -hmm. Unequivocally, mouthwash is bad. The other thing are antacids, proton pump inhibitors, shut down nitric oxide production. You know, there are 200 million prescriptions written every day for things like Prilosec, Prevacid, Nexium. You are so right. I mean, so are very, so many very, patients. Yeah, very dangerous drugs. I mean, there's known side effects. And, you know, the interesting thing is those drugs were never approved to be used more than a couple of days at a time. Mm. And there are people that use them every day for many, many years. Right. You know, the evidence shows that if you're using these for three to five years, you have about 35% higher incidence of heart attack and stroke. Mm. That, the loss of nitric oxide, the inhibition of nitric oxide by PBDs or any of explain that increased risk of uh, heart attack and stroke. Wow. Going back real quick to the mouthwash, what about fluoride in our toothpaste and, and stuff? Is that bad as well? Yeah, absolutely. Fluoride's a neurotoxin. It, combine, it competes with iodine for binding to thyroid hormone. Wow. And it's an antiseptic. You know, people put it in the drinking water and things to kill the bacteria. So, and it's indiscriminate. It kills the bad bacteria and it kills the good bacteria. Fluoride, no, no one in my family uses fluoride toothpaste because of the toxic effects. Wow. It kills your thyroid function, which we have an epidemic of people with hypothyroidism. Um, it's a neurotoxin and it's an antiseptic that kills the oral bacteria and shuts down nitric oxide production. So fluoride really is a trifecta of, of bad things that happen. Wow. So do you use like a water filter or what do you recommend? Yeah, so I use a fluoride-free toothpaste and we have a, um, a whole house system that removes chlorine and fluoride or any halogens or drug metabolites and purifies the water that we eat, drink, or that we cook in, drink, and actually that we bathe in. And that's when people spend a lot of money on purified drinking water. But if they're bathing in municipal water that's full of chlorine and fluoride and drug metabolites and lots of other bad things, they you know, they basically maintain this level of toxicity. And then when you heat the water up to say 104, 110 degrees, which most people shower in, you know, you vaporize a lot of this. So you're not only getting it transdermally, but you're breathing these in. And wow. so the bathing water, when we shower or bathe or, you know, cook our food in water, it's probably, I think, a very important component that people are overlooking that may be contributing to their bad health. 
Wow. Yeah. You don't even really think about it. Um, well, I've heard you say that we are as old as our arteries and, um, I found it so interesting. I listened to your interview, um, uh, you're with, um, Rip Edelston with the Plant Strong oh, yeah. podcast. Yeah. And I wanted to kind of talk with you a little bit about that because yes, this is affecting us as we get older. Absolutely. You know, it's declining. It's putting us at risk for disease, but our kids, I mean, you brought up a good point with these young kids, like what their arteries are looking like. I mean, you look at the rate of obesity in the young kids yeah. and I wish you would just kind of talk about that a little bit so people realize that, wow, I mean, we need to start, you said something about, which really surprised me that young kids can have the arteries of like 50 year olds or something like that. Right. You mentioned. I mean, that's unbelievable. Yeah, we've seen this, you know, there, there's medical devices to look at your endothelial function and provide an arterial age. Uh, it's not invasive, they're FDA cleared, so really useful devices. And so just like you have, so when we look kind of from an average population base, so today we, there's really nothing you or I can do about our chronolog chronological age, right? We get older every day, but okay. then we can do about our biological age. And so for instance, I'll turn 40, 47 in, in a couple of weeks, but I have a biological age of a 26 year old. Wow. And it's consistently. And so we've tested, you know, 16, 17 obese, sedentary, non-active kids that are drinking sodas, eating you know, snacks and junk food, and they'll have the endothelial function of a 40 or 50 year old. Wow. So about this, their risk of disease, age-related vascular disease, is just accelerated by 20 or 30 years. And then you know, we've got people that are even older than I that are in their 50s and 60s that have a biological age of you know a 40 year old. Wow. So Chronological age does not always mirror your biological age. It's what we do, and it's our diet, it's lifestyle, and these kids now who are sedentary, they don't get outside, they're playing video games all day on their phone, they're drinking sodas, eating junk food. I mean, it will catch up to them, and it's going to be a huge. You think there's a burden in the healthcare system now with the baby boomers? Wait till all these gamers and, and sedentary kids who aren't active reach the age where their chronic disease is going to have to be managed. Just, uh, it has to stop. And I think once people understand the etiology of disease and how simply it can be reversed or mitigated through nitric oxide, it's a very simple fix. Yeah. I mean, even, you know, because most people are lazy. They don't want to change their diet. Don't watch. Right. And you, you know, when we're kind of in it all the time and we're studying it and we're looking at it and we're understanding it, we do kind of take for granted that people already know really how to prevent disease. And, and I mean, I took care of a, a young guy that was being tested for COVID and, you know, I started talking to him about, you need to eat your vegetables, you need to exercise, this will help lower your blood pressure. And he was like, exercise decreases my blood pressure. I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, and you just, you take it for granted that people know these things. Um, so yeah, and also with COVID right now, I mean, there, there was the young, a young man that died recently of it. And I thought, wow, this is such crucial information for parents to start changing their kids diet like now. And it's not always easy. I mean, my 12 year old, I fight this with, you know, it's like, you can't live on sugar <laughs> you know it's just not that's not normal that's right. It's not right it's weakening your immune system um so um this next question i kind of took right out of chapter three and i just thought it would be a good place to start like how we derive nitric oxygen from nutrients yeah so there's there's two ways the body makes nitric oxide <clears throat> one is through an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase pathway to be discovered and so when we eat protein, whether it's plant protein, animal protein, any type of protein, proteins are made of acids. And then when we swallow this in the acid environment of the stomach, the protein gets broken down into amino acids. The amino acids are taken up. Then our cells can use those amino acids to make anything we want. And so we, we get L-arginine through our diet. And L-arginine is a semi-essential amino acid, mean, meaning that part of it comes from our diet, part of it comes from on cellular metabolism, part of the urea cycle. 
And so that's how you get nutrients. And then you need, you know, you need incidence and reductance and things to maintain a certain redox balance in that reaction. And then the other thing we discovered is that primarily inorganic nitrate that comes from green tea vegetables and beets, beets are popular because of their nitrate content. And then this molecule nitrate is acted upon by the bacteria and then they reduce that or metabolize it into nitrite and nitric oxide. And so that's why bacteria are so important. It's not just oral bacteria, it's gut bacteria. So if you have dysbiosis of the gut, you know, people are antibiotic regimen for you know many days or weeks have a disruption in that normal flora. And that's why mouthwash is bad because you lose the protective diet on nitric oxide production. That is so interesting how it's all broken down. Um, I got a little confused when I was kind of studying this because, you know, looking at like urinary tract infections when, you know, I'm reading, you know, the results of their urinalysis, okay. you know, it's like, I thought I was confused because I thought nitrates go, you know, are broken down into nitrites, but I feel like what we're reading in the strips is the nitrites, which I thought was a cause of the infection. Okay. That's a marker of the infection. So typically urine is sterile if you don't have a urinary tract infection, right? Mm -hmm. And so part of the nitrate we get from our diet, three minutes after we eat a meal, nitrate's concentrated in our saliva, it's excreted through our salivary glands, and then about 5% of that is reduced into nitrite. Or about 20, 25% is reabsorbed in the kidneys, and then 20% of that is, is reduced to nitrite in the mouth. Mm -hmm. So typically what happens when the kidneys, the kidneys will excrete some nitrate always, mm. but it always reabsorbs nitrate. And nitrate is inert in humans. So unless you have bacteria in your urinary tract, they reduce nitrate to nitrite. And then if you're detecting nitrite in the urine, it's a signal that tells us that you've got bacteria in your urine. Otherwise, mammalian cells cannot metabolize nitrate. And the dipstick measuring urinary was indicative and diagnostic for a UTI. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah, that makes total sense now because, yeah, it's usually totally sterile. And that's right. Okay, so I was kind of on the right track, but I was like, wait a minute, wait, how is this good for us? And then how is this causing infection? Um, well, let's talk about what... It's huh? It's, it depends on which department it is. Yeah. Or which compartment. Yeah, right. Um, it's amazing too. Um, just studying this a little more and listening to you talk about it is like, wow. Because you, you know, we avoid lunch meat, we avoid hot dogs, and those kind of things because of the nitrates, right? Or is it the nitrates? I can't remember which right. one. So, do you? Is it still good to avoid those things? No, save your money. I mean, most people pay a couple dollars more a pound for nitrate and nitrite free mm -hmm. bacon hot dogs or meat. Mm -hmm. you know that if the problem with cured and processed meats or the nitrite and cured and processed meats then vegetarians would have about an eight to ten times higher rate of cancer <clears throat> than so-called meat eaters because 85 percent of our nitrate and nitrite comes from cured and processed or comes from green leafy vegetables only 5%, less than 5% comes from cured and processed meats. There's so little residual nitrite in these meats that it really contributes very little to our overall burden of exposure. But it's providing a very important role in food safety. There's been no substitute ever discovered for, for nitrite cured meats because it prevents foodborne illnesses, it prevents you know, clostridium overgrowth or any foodborne bacteria, and it basically preserves the meat. It creates this nitrosyl hemochrome pigment, this nice red color that you get from cured and processed meats that preserves the stability, mm. prevents lipid oxidation, prevents the density, and preserves shelf life. And so it's critical, and there's no replacement in cured and processed meats, or really cured meats, processed meats that contain no nitrite. Um, but it's, it provides benefit so just like green leafy vegetables, but the point is you cannot eat enough bacon, hot dogs, or lunch meat 
to provide enough nitride for benefit to the body. You get to eat your green leafy vegetables. Mm. Um, well, before we jump into what we need to be doing, you mentioned a couple things that are disruptors. Um, so let's just talk about that real quick. So you said the um, mouthwash yep. and the proton pump inhibitors, which is really huge because like I, so many of my patients are on them for a long periods of time. But if we take it away, then they have GERD, you know, and then they can lead to ulcers and even precancerous lesions. So I think it's important. So we're to, for people to realize, yeah, we're, you, we need to get off these, but to prevent the GERD, it goes right back to lifestyle changes, which all comes around. It seems like, right. you know what I mean? Because the thought of just taking these drugs away from people, they're reliant on them. Um, so how do we fix them? Well, it, <clears throat> gastroesophageal reflux disease is really a symptom of insufficient stomach acid production. So it's, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive or even paradoxical. Because when your body doesn't make enough stomach acid, then what happens? You, you have these incomplete breakdown of proteins into amino acids. And then you create these peptide fragments that then act as antigens. So then they're ordered across the gut, you get leaky gut, and then your body elicits an immune response to it. So our body is natural response. So if we were to eat something with, um, you know, some lettuce with E. coli in it, it makes us sick and we start vomiting. Well, why is that? It's our body's telling us, I need to get this out of my body. This is not good for me. So the same thing when we eat anything and our body can't break those proteins down into amino acids, our stomach then signals, this is not good because I'm about to ingest something that's gonna cause an immune reaction. So what happens, our stomach starts um, increased motility and peristalsis and it refluxes this back out of the sphincter. If you get some type of chemical defect, then you get regurgitation in the esophagus and you know, even a little acid will cause some erosion and burning. But here's what I find. If people that have reflux, number one, you need, you got to ask yourself, what does it take to make stomach acid? You need salt, you need sodium bicarb, you need zinc, and you need some B vitamins. And if your body isn't making stomach acid, you don't absorb B vitamins, you don't absorb zinc, you don't absorb a lot of trace minerals. So it creates this perpetual cycle of insufficient stomach acid. So you got to give the body what it needs and the body heals itself. For people, and I've gotten many people off of PPIs and antacids. So the first thing I do before a meal is I tell them to take a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, which is just flavored acetic acid. So you'll acidify the lumen of the stomach. Is so there that, a kind that tastes good actually? No, not that I <laughs> I'm like, like, I want to do it so bad. I try it, I'm like, oh. Oh, Yeah. And then you give the body back what it needs. You know, you need iodine. Most people are iodine deficient. That's the reason they have hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. But you need iodine to make stomach acid from the parietal cells in the stomach. So you give people iodine, you give them trace minerals, zinc, B vitamins, and then all of a sudden their stomach is making stomach acid and the GERD goes away. Mm. So it's, it goes back to, to basic cell biology and physiology. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's also gastroenterologists may be doing more of this kind of education before just, you know, putting them on something. I think sometimes that's just kind of in medicine, the easy fix, like take a pill for it. And then you have these problems and then, well, you got to take a pill for that. I mean, it's just like build on itself. Yeah, you know? You know, I think this can explain a lot of problems, even in early childhood, you know, kids got a 12 year old and a 10 year old, you know, when they were babies and they would you know, throw up, you'd go and the doctors would put them on these antacids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, we knew enough at that time to where most of the time we didn't allow it. But if you think about this, it explains a lot of foodborne allergies. Like when I was growing up, we didn't have peanut allergies or milk allergies or all the right, right. allergies that we see today. But if you think about it, if you, if you inhibit stomach acid production in babies and newborns, and then you give them breast milk or cow's milk, and their body can't break those milk proteins down into amino acids, then those peptide fragments, undigested protein fragments are absorbed across the gut. Your body elicits an antibody against it because it's a foreign particle. And then every time you're exposed to that, you get an immune reaction. Mm -hmm. So 
completely explains this epidemic of food allergies that start early on with pediatricians giving antacids to babies. It's the worst thing you can do to set these babies up uh, for the rest of their life. Wow. And you know what? You're so right. I mean, like throughout my pediatric rotation, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of times what they did. You know, the babies got reflux. They, they give them the drops or whatever. You're so right. Yeah. And in your book, you even talk about the importance of breast milk. Right? Yeah, you know, yeah. You have to, what we try to do is recapitulate nature, right? And that's a completely different philosophy than pharmacology uh, in, in giving drugs. So if you look at the best thing you can do as a mother is to breastfeed. It protects the baby throughout the entire life. And, you know, really the benefits, you can get it from six months of breastfeeding. So we've analyzed breast milk versus what's in a can or formula that you get on the shelf. And breast milk early on in the colostrum contains really high levels of nitrite. And if you think about that, it goes back to the same thing. Babies are born sterile, right? They're in the sterile environment of the, the uterus. And when they're delivered through a vaginal delivery, you know, when they're meeting this outside world, they're exposed to different bacteria and germs and they become inoculated. And then when they suck, you know, it takes about five to seven days for the bacteria to then enter the gastrointestinal system and then colonize to where they have a nice microbiome. So nitrate has to be metabolized by bacteria in order to be active. So the baby, when they're suckling the colostrum, they don't have any bacteria. So what does the breast milk do? It converts the nitrate to nitrite in the milk so that you're delivering nitrite directly to the baby. And then five to seven days, this ratio of nitrate to nitrite in human breast milk changes because then it's assumed that the baby is then colonized, has the good bacteria, and then they themselves can reduce the nitrate to nitrite. And mm -hmm. the milk is completely absent in this. Mm -hmm. And so I think that explains a lot of the health disparities between formula fed and breastfed babies because they're exposed to this early on in breast milk where they're not in formula milk. Wow. We've been demonstrated this experimentally in necrotizing enterocolitis, which is still 20% you know, mortality in, in babies that are born with a hypoxic gut and they get necrotic. We can completely rescue them by just giving back nitrite in the formula. So you, you can imagine in, in the neonatal intensive care unit, most mothers aren't able to breastfeed because they're either an incubator or on a ventilator right. it's to give them formula. Um, and if you just add a little bit of nitrite to the formula, you completely eliminate necrotizing enterocolitis. Wow. Um, is that like adults are, I've been reading, I've seen kind of, I haven't researched it much, but like adults are taking colostrum or it's like, I was like, what? <laughs> but do you think that's <laughs> why they're doing that? <laughs> the well, you know, is people, a little disturbing. People, but <laughs> well, you know, people think that colostrum is, you know, you're getting immunoglobulins and helping your immune system. Mm. There's more to it than that. You know, in babies, we think that you're conferring a lot of, you know, immunity from mother to baby through breast milk. But I think just as important, if not more important, you're providing a source of nitric oxide in that baby early on that then sets the stage for them to maintain good blood flow, good circulation, all their organs and cells are getting perfused. And if they're not getting this, then they have decreased blood flow. Certain regions or certain organs become hypoxic and then they become necrotic, disease sets in and you have health problems for the rest of your life. Wow. Um, so what other things are we doing to ourselves to uh, decrease our nitric oxide? Well, you know, we're not getting exercise. People have become sedentary. Um, the other thing for me, it's all about, you know, two disease, disease is caused by two things and two things only. All diseases. Your body's missing something that it needs or it's exposed to something that it doesn't. And so you have to, you know, address both sides of that coin. And so most people are toxic. You know, no one sweats anymore. Mm. Leave our air-conditioned home, get in our air-conditioned cars and go to our air conditioned office, and nobody sweats. In fact, a huge move in plastic surgery to remove, have sweat glands removed or, or lasered to where you don't sweat. That's horrible. It's yeah. the main root of excretion of toxins. It's breathing, sweat,
sweating, urination, defecation. That's your main routes of toxin uh, removal. And so people got to sweat. My favorite thing to do, I live in Texas in the summer, that's no problem for us. But in the winter and even in the summer, I use an infrared sauna okay. because not providing light that can stimulate nitric oxide production, but it's providing heat, and then your body sweats and you get rid of the toxins. Mm. Um, so that, that's a very simple thing. And, and these are common sense, not expensive type strategies that you can do that'll have a profound effect on your health. Mm. Right. Move. We got to exercise. What's the first sign that what we should look for that we're deficient in nitric oxide? Well, usually the first sign and symptom is some type of dysregulation of blood flow. And that usually manifests as erectile dysfunction. And ED is not just a male disease, it's female. You know, you have, people have female sexual arousal disorder, <clears throat> um, you know, anorgasmic women, because you have to have an increase in blood flow mm -hmm. to both sex organs. Mm -hmm. What controls increase in blood flow to those organs? It's nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. You can't generate nitric oxide after bed of your sex organs, and you can't get engorgement, men can't get erections, women become anorgasmic. So that's usually the first sign. And 50% of the men over the age of 40 self-report erectile dysfunction. Yeah, it's on the rise. I, I think they're much higher because most men are going to self-report ED. And then the other thing is an elevation in blood pressure. You know, nitric oxide is what maintains normal blood pressure. And we know that two out of three Americans, over 200 million Americans, have an unsafe elevation in blood pressure. Mm -hmm. so the main two, ED and an increase in blood pressure. And then you insulin resistant, get metabolic syndrome. Uh, so it's very simple, recognizable symptoms that tell us we're nitric oxide deficient. I cannot believe the amount of young men that as I'm reviewing their medications are on Viagra or yeah. Adenophil or, and it's like, wow. I mean, these are young men that should be vibrant and alive. And so what do you think about those drugs, by the way? I mean, I know, would it be easier to supplement with like nitric oxide as opposed to taking Viagra? Well, yeah, it tells us that, you know, you make a good point there. 50 per, well, 45% of the men that are given these PD-5 inhibitors for ED don't respond. Mm. They don't see an improvement in erections. And so why is that? It's because they're, they're, they can't make any nitric oxide. So these drugs work downstream of nitric oxide production. So if you, and we've published, we've got clinical trials on this, that if you, if you take non-responders to things like Cialis or Viagra and you, and you give them nitric oxide, you turn non-responders into responders and you can turn down the dosing of these drugs, which increases their safety profile. So I think there's, they're just like with any drug. I think they, they provide an intended effect, but they always have unintended consequences. And so our approach has always been get to the root cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. Root cause of the problem is insufficient nitric oxide production. And so address that. So I know, um, you know, Dr. Edelston wrote, you know, how to reverse, you know, heart disease, prevent and reverse heart disease. And you, and when you study these people that have done this, it's through plant-based diet, through increasing yeah. plants. So you would think with erectile dysfunction, more education would be there. Hey, you know, turn turn more to a plant-based diet, eat your green leafy vegetables and your whole quality of life is gonna get better, That's you right. know? Yeah, I've had many discussions with Dr. Esselstein and, you know, just like any, you don't you don't have a 100% response in 100% of the patient. You know, he's shown clear evidence that people have reversed heart disease and see the plaque regression with a plant-based diet. But when I began talking to him, you know, that got us into, we got Rip interested, was that how do you explain the non-responders? How do you explain that people convert to a plant-based diet but see no regression? Mm. And it, now it can be explained by mouthwash or antibiotics because if yeah. you're bacteria that convert the nitrate in plants to bioactive nitrite or nitric oxide, they're not going to get it. And that was kind of his epiphany. He goes, holy, he goes, man, I've never even asked my patients if they're taking mouthwash or, you know, sometimes we'll put them on a regimen of antibiotics and they have a, you know, a slight infection. He goes, but I never thought about the consequences of that. He goes, that may completely explain 
the people that don't respond to a plant-based diet. Mm. Of course it does. <laughs> it's obvious to me, but you know, as right. you said, you know, it's not obvious to everybody. Right. So the, the uh, mouthwash is affecting the oral microbiome uh, and then the antibiotics more affecting the gut. Um, well, systemic. I mean, they're, they're systemic. They're affecting yeah, the yeah. as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, I feel like since I've studied more about the microbiome and antibiotic use, and I very, I am very cautious with antibiotics. I find I do a lot more education, a lot more waiting it out. Like, hey, let's make sure this isn't viral. I mean, let's postpone this, treat more symptomatically, yeah. as opposed to just giving an antibiotic for everything. And even COVID. I mean, you know, we know it's a virus. Um, we know it. You know, it's not going to respond to antibiotics. So you're kind of at a hard point when, you know, you're doing these x-rays and you're seeing these changes in their lungs and it's infectious and inflammatory. And it's like, oh, you know, they've got some pneumonia, but is it viral? Is it bacterial? You know, it's, it's tough. That's tough. Um, so ultimately the consequences of this nitric oxide is basically high blood pressure, even diabetes, heart disease, erectile dysfunction, what else, you know, that's, that's top some, what else? Yeah, I mean, everybody's scared of, of Alzheimer's. I mean, the earliest oh, state yeah. of Alzheimer's, vascular dementia is reduced blood flow. <clears throat> we've, we've done studies in patients with cognitive disorder in kind of the pre-Alzheimer's phase, and we give them a cognitive test, they do very poorly. We get functional MRI imaging of their brain and show there's hypoperfusion or reduced blood flow to the prefrontal cortex where you recall memory. And then we, we spend 30 days of normalizing your nitric oxide production. And in 30 days, we re-administer the cognitive exam. They do very well. And we can show, to, to me, every single disease is a blood flow problem. And if you correct blood flow, then you get the good stuff into cells, the bad stuff out, the cells regenerate and they do their job. So you give the body what it needs, the body heals itself. Wow, yeah. Um, let's talk about real quick, like what, what do you recommend? When you have people, what, what do we need to start doing? What do we need to do more of every day? Well, we need to eat more green leafy vegetables um, and get more nitrate. Or, you know, we published a paper in 2015 that there are regional differences in the amount of nitrate in certain vegetables. So it's not always sufficient to just eat more green leafy vegetables. And most people try to eat organic and organic vegetables have about 10 times less nitrate and nitrite than conventionally grown. I was gonna ask you about that. Why is that? Well, it's, it's because our, an organic label doesn't allow you to add nitrogen-based fertilizers. Mm. And standardize and quantify the amount of nitrogen that your plants are utilizing for nutrient assimilation. Mm. So there's less nitrogen in the soil, because you're not adding nitrogen-based fertilizers, and so there's less nitrate assimilation into the plants and vegetables. Uh, you know, exercise. Get out and exercise and use an infrared sauna. Stop using mouthwash. Stop using antacids. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, I think we have to supplement. You know, I was never a big supplement taker, but there's evidence now showing that even if we eat all the right foods that we're supposed to, there's still missing trace minerals and nutrients in our body. So we almost have to take supplements in order to get the adequate amount of nutrients that our cells need to do their job. Mm. So what should we be using? What should we be taking? You know, should we I be tested first? Or? Say again? Oh, I mean, like, how do we know what we're supposed to be taking? Well, you can do a micronutrient analysis. Um, you know, there are tests out there that'll tell you basically every trace mineral nutrient if you're deficient in. Wow. Okay. You know, there's, unfortunately, there's not a one size fits all. We're all different. Right. Everybody has different metabolic demands, nutrient demands, and you know, the foods we eat are different. So you have to, you have to personalize it and, and figure out what you need. But things like humic and fulvic, which contain a lot of natural trace minerals and nutrients, um, I take our nitric oxide supplement every day, depending on the time of year and what we're exposed to, you know, I'll fortify my immune system, but you know, I'm active. I try to eat, um, balanced diet, somewhat healthy. I exercise every day. I use an infrared sauna every day, and then I eat and drink and bathe in good, clean water. 
um, I, I thought it was important to mention, like you recommend eating the green leafy vet, like the sat, I thought it was interesting when you talk about why we should be eating salad before we eat. And it has all, all to do with this nitric oxide, right? Right, well, there's postprandial oxidative stress and inflammation after every meal, mm -hmm. right? And so the social norms is typically we eat our salad before I'm Texas, uh, I'm a steak eater, steak potato guy. <laughs> and so there's evidence that when you process that uh, the meat and fat, you can cause, you know, this acute inflammation and oxidative stress. But if you allow that time for that nitrate in your salad to be converted to nitric oxide or even nitrite, you prevent a lot of that postprandial inflammation and oxidative stress that occurs when you're digesting a big meal. Mm -hmm. Did you say you're eating steak and you have the arteries of a 26 year old? <laughs> Is that right? right? It's because you're eating salad before your steak, right? <laughs> and I take our nitric oxide. <laughs> that's right. And that's your company, right? I wanted to mention that. Can, can people just buy nitric oxide and take it as a supplement? I mean, how do you know how much you need? Yeah, well, we developed and commercialized technology 10 years, and I, I'm not going to mention the product on here just because it's not my intent to, to sell product. It's to educate mm -hmm. and to inform your listeners to make educated and informed decisions. So you can look, uh, you know, we've had it on the market for over 10 years. It's a lozenge that basically we put nitric oxide active components in this matrix, and when you put it in your mouth, it slowly dissolves and it generates nitric oxide gas. So it's an oral lozenge. Uh, we've got seven or eight published peer-reviewed clinical trials on that, uh, many, many patents. And so when people are looking for a nitric oxide product, uh, I tell them to look for certain things, look for patents. If you're buying a nitric oxide product, look for patents on the package label because that tells you that there's something innovative, different than any other product out there. Mm -hmm. Then number two, look for published clinical trials on that product. Because if, if a product works, you should be able to demonstrate it in controlled clinical trials. Uh, and you can easily do that. We've got seven, probably more now published clinical trials on that. Mm -hmm. we'll do some background on the company is that, you know, the people that make this product, are they nitric oxide centric? Has the inventor published anything in the nitric oxide field? You know, frustrating for me is, you know, people try to copy, you know, I guess mimicry is the best form of flattery. Um, but it's mm -hmm. frustrating because, you know, we want to provide accurate in information and education that people can say this exact same things that I say on our product labels. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got these talking heads and I'm, you know, do a PubMed search or Medline search and people have never published a single paper on nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a complicated, complex science. And so people have to realize, and to me, it's humorous now because I think, okay, Big Pharma has been unsuccessful at developing safe and effective nitric oxide drugs for 30 years. They have an unlimited budget, the best and brightest minds, but yet some pharmacist or some person who's never published in nitric oxide is now uh, going to make a nitric oxide product. Yeah, right. Right, right, right. Well, Olympic athletes have used your products, right, to improve athletic performance. Yeah, we have the entire U.S. Olympic team. We have probably 180 professional NCAA programs um, that use it. So, you know, we, we encourage people to go with the science, go with clinically proven patented technology that's, you know, formulated and created by people who know what nitric oxide is and understand the science. Um, talk about, um, you know, because sometimes, you know, you just want to do it yourself. And talk about these strips that you've created, because I think that is so interesting. Well, you know, over 10 years ago, when we, when we were trying to bring to market a nitric oxide product, people didn't know what nitric oxide was. I mean, even less than today, 10 years later. And so the number one thing we got, well, the response we got back was, how do I know if I need nitric oxide? It's a valid right. question. Right? That's so right. It's not like vitamin D where you can go and just pull your blood levels and say, okay, well, I'm low in vitamin D. I need to take it. Nitric oxide is not like that. Uh, so we had to create a test. And so understanding this metabolism of nitrite in the oral cavity, I developed these salivary test strips. It's very similar to a urinary test strip. So what we're measuring is salivary nitrite. Mm. If the body has the right oral bacteria that's reducing nitrate to nitrite, you'll turn that test strip peak 
and it tells us that your body's making some nitric oxide. Mm. But if it doesn't, then it tells us that your body's not making sufficient nitric oxide. Mm. So it's a good tool to have in your toolbox, but it doesn't tell us why you're deficient. Is it because you're using mouthwash? Is it because your diet is awful? Is it because you have endothelial dysfunction and you're not getting enough exercise? So it tells us that you're nitric oxide deficient, but it doesn't tell us why. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. Um, so what about probiotics? Is that, is that good for us to take? Does that help us in this, in this area or is it not really, you know? You know, I'm, I take a probiotic just because I think it's, I think it's good for us, but you gotta think, you know, from a macro level, we're taking a couple of billion CFUs and introducing it into a environment that has trillions of cells, right? Less than 0.1% of the overall bacterial burden. Um, you know, but there's, there's some evidence in some published clinical trials that, you know, probiotics, especially after an antibiotic regimen, mm -hmm. replete that community. Um, but as it relates to the oral microbiome, there's no evidence whatsoever. In mm -hmm. fact, to the contrary, we published, I think in 2016, that lactobacillus in the oral cavity is disruptive to nitric oxide production. Oh, wow. And most probiotics contain a lactobacillus. Mm -hmm. But most of those are in a capsule that are, you know, delivered in the lumen of the gut. I don't know if there's any translocation back to the oral cavity, but lactobacillus in our model systems seem to disrupt nitric oxide production. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, just kind of closing, what are, what, what are actionable steps that we need to do start today? Well, educate on, on the importance of nitric oxide. I think if your listeners, you know, I've got the book, the Functional Nitric Oxide Nutrition, that was an updated form of my book called The Nitric Oxide Solution that I published probably in 2011, more than almost 10 years ago. Um, I've got an educational website, drnathansbryan.com. There's a six minute video on that website that'll basically tell you everything we've just discussed in the past 45 or 50 minutes and six minutes. Um, but then, you know, take action and, you know, change your diet, change your lifestyle. It's really very simple. Stop using mouthwash, get rid of fluoride, stop using antacids, exercise, throw in some more green leafy vegetables, take a nitric oxide uh, product to help restore your nitric oxide production. And then exercise, get out and move and sweat and be active. And it's those simple things right there that, I've seen an amazing transformation in people's health. It's amazing because it sounds so simple, but it all so starts simple. with being educated and applying that knowledge and making the decision to take control of your health. Well, it's discipline. It's discipline. Yeah. And it's, discipline. it's hard work staying healthy, especially in today's environment. Right. <laughs> you got to work hard at it. Okay. But the dividends pay off because it's, you know, once you get sick, you know, we all have a limited time here on earth. And so we have to have a quality of life and enjoy our time. And if we're sick or suffering from chronic disease, I mean, what, what value does your life have at that point? Right. You're so right. So what is the dream or the impact you want to have on the world with your work? Well, you know, I want my legacy to be that I was the guy who brought nitric oxide to the masses. Um, and so part of that, the main portion of that is education and just creating awareness around nitric oxide to you know, practitioners as well as patients and consumers. And then to do that, you have to create safe and effective technologies. So my overall objective and mission is to bring nitric oxide product technologies across all market segments around the globe. We've been very successful in the, in the nutrition and dietary supplement space. I've created a topical nitric oxide skin serum for you know, fine lines and wrinkles. So you know, there's nothing we can do getting old, but we can certainly affect the way we look and not looking old. Uh, that's been a very successful technology. We've got drug applications, not just for coronavirus, but for things like heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, uh, coronary artery disease, um, and then even topical drug applications for wound care, non-healing ulcers, acne. Um, so I think, you know, the science is leading us to develop technologies, nitric oxide technologies to affect every major poorly managed disease around the globe. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, 
Well, I listened to one of your lectures. I think it was actually for dental students. And that was, that was really good. But I thought I liked, I couldn't believe what you talked about. I talk, you talked about your dad and this, oh, yeah. and this wound that he had, this unbelievable wound from a burn. Um, so I've seen those wounds in my practice, obviously for a long time, but I found what was actually not that long ago. I took care of this woman. She's like for five years, I've been dealing, nobody, she came to the urgent care and I was going to fix it after she's been seen all these different specialists. Right. And I thought, wow. I mean, when I heard your story about your dad, I thought that's incredible. I mean, that's really incredible because so yeah. many people have these wounds that it's not detrimental. Yeah. You know, I think when we're excited about that because, you know, dad's a paraplegic from a car accident, T11 injury from, you know, 1984. Um, and so he's dealt with these decubitus pressure ulcers for, for many, many years. And, you know, we've managed them. And then when he got that severe wound, you know, it made sense to me because to heal a wound, you got to do three things, especially a pressure ulcer. You got to kill the infection. You've got to increase blood flow to the wound and you've got to eliminate the pressure. And so nitric oxide does two of those three. It's antimicrobial and it causes the hyperemia and gets blood flow to that organ or that, wound so you can get granulation or new tissue growth. And so we demonstrated that in a very, you know, stage four non-healing four-year-old ulcer and regrew enough tissue that then we was a candidate for a surgical flap and you know, completely healed the wound. That's so, amazing. And it's a remarkable result, but it's a very simple way of thinking and a very simple solution just by providing nitric oxide. Yeah, I thought that was amazing. I, I thought I was going to talk to you about that. Wow. Well, I'm sure he's really proud of you and all the work you're doing. That's pretty awesome. I'm sure your kids are and your family is too. I mean, it's pretty incredible. And it's so awesome wow. that you're sharing it with everybody and talking to me today. So I can continue to share the word about everything you're doing because it's so needed. I mean, chronic disease is huge. It seems to be on the rise despite everything we have, despite exercising more than ever. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to share a story and educate your listeners on the importance of nitrous oxide. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Take care. Thank you.